Uh, hopefully you're in the right spot. Uh, my name is Erin Schrader. This is Little Projects, Big Improvements, Small Step Content Strategy. Uh, and I'm going to be using a case study from the state of Massachusetts today. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. A little bit about me. Um, I am a content strategist, senior content strategist at Lullabot. And so you've seen quite a few of us this week. Um, I live in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And I started in journalism and teaching, actually. Um, was a journalist for newspapers for a long time and moved into web copywriting and then moved into content strategy. So that's what brings me here. And I really love it because I love making website structure and content better. And that's really what I'm here to do. Um, so what is this small step content strategy? Well, it all kind of starts with the one true thing we know, which is that our websites are kind of messy. Um, a few things might be missing. It's maybe been out for a long time. You haven't really, it's one of those things you always intend to get to. Um, websites kind of become like junk drawers in our house where we're, we're gonna get to it next week. <laughs> we never get to it. Um, but it's kind of interesting because what ends up happening is when you look at the symptoms of your website not working, it's kind of that it's everywhere. Um, it's kind of nowhere. So you might have a lot of stuff. You might not have enough of the right stuff. You might be lacking uh, the best kind of flow for your site. So you aren't really getting people through a process that they need to follow, and in government that's especially important. Maybe you have a lot of content rot, which if you've not heard of that definition, it means redundant, outdated, and trivial content. Also very common with websites as they age. So your content really should be consistent and digestible and findable and helpful to people who need it. But sometimes it's doing its job and sometimes it might be missing the beat. So in the back of your mind, you're like, I know I just need a redesign. Uh, and maybe that excites you, right? When we think about a redesign, we get really excited about building this new thing and we wanna set it on fire and rise from the ashes with this great brand new thing that's so sparkly and everything's perfect. And it feels so good when we can do that. But we know that's really not possible. It's really hard to do. It's hard to do for lots of organizations, actually. It's because it's expensive. It's because it takes time. It's because it has a need for a lot of resources, and it has a lack of stakeholder buy-in. So um, UserZoom did a study in 2022, and um, this was some of the reasons that a lot of companies can't do full redesigns, uh, time constraints, and budget constraints, and resource constraints. So if that sounds familiar, or if you're nodding along because you've heard that before in your own organization, maybe you're shedding a single tear because you feel seen right now, um, this might be a really great process to give a shot to. So the real question is, what if you could make these changes one little bit at a time? And I don't know who watches the home shows where the designer comes in and is like, I'm gonna fix five bedrooms. And then she leaves at the end of the episode, she's like, I only fixed two bedrooms. My brain's always like, what happened to the other three bedrooms? Um, so I have a real hard time wrapping my head around this when I first went after it. But um, mindfulness and meditation has taught me that small steps are just as good as big steps. So uh, let's pretend we're going one room at a time. So what if you could make those improvements one little bit at a time? What does that look like? So I'm gonna ask you to blow out that match. Don't burn the house down. Uh, don't burn the website down uh, because we're gonna take this in a little bit tiny, tinier steps. It's gonna be really useful. And so all of this is to say that content strategy in a small step is taking one small section of your site and making it better, using it to build a case for more changes in your website. Um, and so we're gonna do this with a really great project that I did with the state of Massachusetts where um, that's exactly what we tried to do. So you might be saying, that sounds awesome, but where do I start? And I can't really answer that for you. But what I can say is that if you can identify what's causing the heartburn, if you can check out the performance of top pages, maybe something's flipping, um, ask your frontline staff. I'm gonna sing the praises of our frontline staff, especially in our government agencies, because they're the ones answering calls and emails all the time for stuff that you are probably saying, it's on the website, it's there. Um, but they are gonna be your source of uh, truth for a lot of stuff that you might use to improve your website. Content is maybe not serving its function. Uh, maybe your calls to action aren't working, and maybe you have a lot of rot content that needs to be sorted out. So there's lots of reasons that you might need a redesign, and there might be a lot of places on your site that you're already thinking, I know exactly where I can start with this. So, as I mentioned, I did this with the state of Massachusetts, um, and I'm not sure if anyone here is from Massachusetts, but their website is mass.gov. Every agency lives on mass.gov. 
So where a lot of states have different agency websites separate, mass.gov is one behemoth website. Obviously, when the Division of Apprentice Standards said, we need some website help, they couldn't say, shut down mass.gov and we'll just work on this one agency. And admittedly, the Division of Apprentice Standards is a small agency. So this was our process with them. Um, they really focus on connecting job seekers and students with earn and learn opportunities in the community. And so again, like many state governments, they have hundreds of agencies, but they can't tear down that website to fix just one. So this is the process we took. Um, DAS, for short, uh, had a few problems. And they were a really hardworking, dedicated group of people. I really adored their team. They were small, they had a few resources to tackle, but their content was pretty outdated. Um, it was, had been written years ago by someone who wasn't really savvy on you know, plain language and writing for an audience, so it was a lot of jargon. Um, the navigation was quite clunky, and a lot of the pages lacked a clear path. So if a job seeker wanted to find an apprenticeship, there wasn't really that kind of easy pathway to get there. And so our job was really coming in and saying, okay, these are the problems, we think, um, but now where do we start? Now, this is where I get really excited because I'm like, I know how to fix it, and no, Aaron, stop. I had to stop and say, no, we have to slow down. <laughs> you need to chill out for a second and take a breath. I get like this when I clean my house too, so just, uh, there's a lot of similarities between my home and being a content strategist. Um, <laughs> just, just totally honest. So anyway, I had to slow down and really make a plan. And so with this team, we sat down and said, okay, there's only a few of us on the Lullabot side, or there's me on the Lullabot side helping. There's only a few of you that can work on this project. So we need to take this in, in kind of a, a process that we can all work with together. So please remember going into even a small project, you gotta plan for the big stuff. And we'll talk about the big stuff today as well. You know, the discovery and the research, making time to talk to users, gathering your content inventory, understanding what you're working with, you gotta do all of that even if it's a small project. So in our agenda today, essentially we're gonna walk through these processes. Identify your resources, what do we have to work with, what's our budget, what's our timeline. Identify your resources, uh, define your goals, oh, sorry, define your goals and identify your resources. Know your audience, gather your stuff, prioritize and then implement and measure. And again, small project, small timeline, small resources, small team, small budget, <laughs> lots to look at, not a lot of pages, but still a lot of stuff to do. How do we do it? Um, but you can do it and this is how we did it. So first we started with defining our goals. You can have goals conversations that go on for months. You really could. You get enough people in the room and everyone's gonna have a different goal. But we really wanted to focus on what problem we were trying to solve. Yes, the content was outdated and jargon heavy. Yes, the navigation was clunky. But that wasn't really the problem we're trying to solve. So we really had to think about who is affected by this, by these things that are symptomatic. And so I asked them. I said, tell me more. What's, what are you trying to do with this website? What are you trying to solve? but I really wanted to make sure they didn't give me this type of stuff. You don't want to be too general. You don't want to say, we just want to make stuff better. It doesn't really have a lot of value. Get more traffic, who doesn't? Have happier visitors, sure. Sell more stuff, be more well known, not helpful. Those are too broad, they're too amorphous. They're not bad ideas, we all want those things, but they're not really gonna help us really get to the goal of the project that we set out for. So I said, let's get a little bit deeper with that. And so they came back and said, really, our goal is to connect job seekers and business owners with information about apprenticeships. Yeah, fair. That's what they want to do. That's what they're here to do. They're here to help people find opportunities. And this was important because this was our starting goal. And I know I'm, I'm probably sounding just way too demanding, but I wanted more from them. And there's nothing wrong with tweaking and improving and asking why. One thing that we say a lot at Lullabot, our strategists will say, all of our answers, and I've got some all about here that have heard it, we say it depends because we will ask why about 10,000 times. We are five-year-old toddlers asking where brain comes from all the time because we need answers before we can make decisions. But we wanted to get smart about this because that was a good goal, but it really wasn't measurable. So I don't know how many of you out there have heard of SMART goals before. Um, they're used all the time. They're, it's a very marketable kind of acronym, but we created SMART goals. And SMART goals stand for goals that are specific. And of course, it's not gonna load. Why aren't you loading? All right, there we go. Specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. 
and I'll just define these a little bit more to explain what they really mean. Um, but a SMART goal is really going to help us be intentional about what we're trying to do in this project. So a specific goal. A specific goal answers specific questions. Pretty easy to follow. What needs to be accomplished, who's responsible for this, and what steps need to be taken to achieve it. We needed to understand that. We know what we want to do, we know who we want to talk to, but we need to know how we're going to get there. So let's start thinking about that. We want our goals to be measurable. We want to see a percentage increase of traffic. Um, in their case, a percentage or decrease of negative feedback from the website. Maybe a percentage or a specific target for conversions or people clicking calls to action to do something. Make stuff better isn't measurable, um, but a percentage increase of traffic is something we can actually keep our eyes on. We wanted the goal to be attainable. Does the metric make sense? We don't want to say, we want a 500% new traffic visitors. Like, that's not, that's not achievable. But does it make sense for us? Is our team large enough to handle the project? Do we have the appropriate team and resources and tools to do it? And those are big questions, too, because when you're working with a small team, who's on your team? We'll talk about teams in a minute, but that was important for us to con consider. Relevancy. The relevant goal should tie to the greater goal. So DAS is one of many bureaus and one of many departments, and one of many agencies at the state of Massachusetts. So their work ties in with other agencies. So we needed to understand that things we were changing here would affect other agencies down the line. We want to understand how this project might coincide with other projects going on. We might want to know if our team intends to continue improvements post lunch. So relevancy is really important to your goals too. And lastly is time-based, and that's really just putting a snapshot of time around the project or when you want to measure. And it could be weeks, months, quarters, years, whatever you decide. But we knew that this content, because they were working with the grant, we had a very limited time we could get this done. So we came back and said, let's really write this down and stick to it. So our version two goal was that the team wanted to see an increase in positive user feedback from the website by about 40% in three to six months after launch. They wanted to do this project in about five months, given that the grant had kind of limitations. We wanted to decide on the focus on reorganizing the content into more navigable pages and rewrite some content to a plain language eighth grade level. And we wanted to focus on transactional opportunities to help connect job seekers with open apprenticeships. So not quite as related, but they also had this really great idea, and it was kind of a pipe dream initially, to create a promotional landing page to use on flyers and in schools, at school fairs and job fairs to help highlight the benefits of apprenticeships. So that was kind of a confetti on the cake, if we could get to it. But we really wanted to step back and nail something down, because that first goal still had value. So that goal about connecting job seekers and businesses with apprenticeship programs is still really valuable. So that first draft goal that we had really became valuable to us because we turned it into a core strategy statement. Core strategy statements are statements that identify audiences, content attributes, purpose, and key actions that audiences should take. And this was another thing where they were like, well, we already have a goal, so what's this? And I said, oh, let's talk about it. Um, so to build a good core strategy statement, you can really start with a Mad Lib. And I'm so serious when I say that. Um, and I'm going to show you the Mad Lib we started with because it really made it easier for us to go in and workshop it together. So here's our Mad Lib core strategy statement. The content we produce for blank helps reach blank by <laughs> providing blank, blank content that will blank. Um, so you can really fill in the blanks for real uh, using this Mad Lib core strategy statement. What was good about this is it became our rally cry. And we started using this once we drafted the first one and kind of tweaked it a little, we really made it our purpose. And when we talked to stakeholders or budget holders or anybody that was outside of the project team, we would show this as the reason that we were doing what we were doing. So it became a very helpful tool for us. So our first draft was, all right, it says that we want to produce content that helps the Division of Apprentice Standards reach reach constituents by providing good content that helps audiences become apprentices. Our, our content should be helpful for audiences to feel relieved, stress-free, and educated to submit their application and prog or progress the apprenticeship program goals. Excuse me. Um, but we didn't want to overpromise, which is what we kind of did. Because job seeking, relieved, stress-free, uh-uh. No, no, those are not words you want to promise for a job seeker. 
And then saying constituents was a little bit too broad too because we know that the audience we have is more specific and we also know it's not just for apprentices. So again, we went back and, and tweaked it. Again, I used to teach, so I'm ready to make corrections. Um, final draft, we broke it down and this became our final. Well, the content we produce helps the DAS reach prospective apprentices and employee sponsors by offering clear, helpful content that helps lead audiences to apply for apprenticeship or apprenticeship sponsorship, respectively. Our content should help audiences feel confident, informed, and prepared to submit their application or progress their apprenticeship program goals. And then I was like, put it on a pillow. Oh, we didn't really. Um, but it really did become our live, laugh, love pillow for all of our conversations with stakeholders. So anytime a stakeholder came by for a demo or we were making decisions, um, we made sure that we explained the content strategy statement again, the course strategy statement. And it became a really useful tool for that. Um, and it, it was a good exercise for them because they were kind of tasked with doing this project, but they didn't really know what direction to go. And once we had that down on paper, it was, okay, now we have our mission. It was a mission statement. Okay, great. We identified our goals. Do we have the right people in the room? And like I said, we had, I think, three people at the DAS side. We had, they had me over on, on the Lullabot side, and we're like, who can do what? So now we had to talk about our resources. Who do we still need to help us? So we really asked, who needs to be involved? What content resources do we need? What technical resources do we need? Where could extra resources help us, and where do we need a vendor? Well, they had me. But as we started looking around the room, we're like, man, it would be really nice to have someone from the digital team here that has a little bit of Drupal experience for some of this. I am a content strategist, um, and I don't, I didn't, I wasn't raised in the Drupal world, um, so I was like, I'm not that, I'm not that person. Can we find like a developer, somebody that can help us? So we found someone from the digital side on the mass, uh, in the mass digital office, who was like, yeah, I've got time. I'll come help you with your project. Excellent. Um, we had, uh, they tapped some folks in marketing to help them with some of the promotional page photos. They wanted some new photos, not stock photos, but real photos of apprentices. And the marketing team said, absolutely, we can take those for you. So we started gathering kind of our backup squad <laughs> to help us with some of these things. And again, we did that at the beginning. We wanted to set that expectation. We knew it was ahead of us. We needed to know who we had to work with us. We also wanted to make sure that we had state decision makers and stakeholders in our corner. So we had them get involved. We invited them to meetings, and I'll talk about the schedule in a minute, but we made sure that everything was really transparent. We didn't want anyone to feel like we were pulling them in last minute. We didn't want anyone to feel like they were having to make decisions for 10 things on a call. So we really brought them in at the right time. And we also needed a writer, and turns out the person from the digital side also was a writer. So we had, we had some folks who were Swiss Army knives of uh, skill sets, which was really good for us. So yay, team is gathered. Uh, we did not go fight in an alley after this, if you know the movie. Um, but your team can be your, fav your favorite people, and they might be some not so favorite people. And that's okay, put all that aside because you really wanna focus on the vested interest in the audience you're trying to help. So now that we're ready to get started, we can talk about ex expectation setting. And I love this quote, and I, I use it in my da daily life. But Rory Baden is an author and leadership speaker, and he says, people can't live up to expectations they don't know have been set for them. Oh boy, that one, that got you, it gets you right in the gut when you read that sometimes. But we had to talk to the folks that we brought in to set expectations with them. We knew what we wanted to do, but they didn't really know the full extent of what we were trying to get done. So we held a kickoff, um, and it was kind of like our kickoff internally where we all talked to each other and introduced each other. But we said, here's what we've learned, Here's our core strategy statement, here's our goals, here's what we're thinking needs to happen, and here's kind of the steps we wanna take. And we've made a document of who does what, we wrote down um, the schedule of events, a kind of a rough schedule of events that we wanted to follow, and we answered questions about the process and the project. And so again, it was all about transparency. We wanted everyone to feel like they were part of this team, even if they're not in the weekly calls. So for an example, we set up an example timeline to share with stakeholders to say, hey, in month one, we're gonna really focus on discovery. We're gonna use user interviews, we're gonna do content inventory and audit. We're gonna tackle that audit together and we're gonna review those researches, uh, review that research and interviews. Then we're gonna build some personas and understand the outcomes of those personas and the journeys that they're on, which is gonna lead into our journey map. And in month four, we're gonna to try to build that content matrix and start implementing. Now, I said at the beginning this was a five-month project, and it was. And we left month five intentionally. 
So I didn't want to put pressure on us to say, we're going to do this in four months, but that fifth month became our bleed over. So if we had stuff that took a little bit longer or needed a little bit more time, we knew we had that buffer. Always, always put buffers into your project if you can. Um, and of course, there were some things that spilled over, but that, that month five really helped us. We also established some standards with our extended team, with our internal team that was going to be doing this day to day. We sat and said, who's going to make decisions? Who do we need in our corner? When is something considered done? Oh, I know we've all been there. Is this done? Yeah. <laughs> is it really done? We don't know. So we had to sit down as a group and say, when is something considered done? Who signs off to say it's done and ready? When should we meet? How often? Where are we tracking our progress? How do we share our work? What tools should we use to communicate? Now, we did have a project manager on the, on the Massachusetts side that helped us with some of this. But as a team, it wasn't up to her to answer this. We wanted, as a team, to understand what things were, what things were going on and how we could contribute. So we tracked all of this down. We shared it. We understood it. For instance, at Lullabot, we used Slack primarily. And their team used um, Teams. And so rather than moving into my environment, I'm the only person on the outside of Teams, I moved into Teams. There was our communication tool. We created a channel for ourselves. We used a, a project plan in Google Maps, uh, Google Maps, <laughs> Google Spreadsheets to show us where we were in the project to try to stick to our schedule. And we created this example calendar um, that we set up to say, hey, Mondays and Fridays are stand-ups. Um, Stand-ups are an agile form of like a 15 to 20 minute meeting to kind of review what the work is in progress and where you're headed. So we looked at the stand-ups and we said, okay, Mondays and Fridays. Mondays will be what we're doing for the week. Fridays are what we got done. And then Wednesdays we'll do a stand-up that's kind of blockers or what's going on. And every other Wednesday we'll have a decision point. So we really stuck to that calendar as a way to say, okay, stakeholders, on the Blue Star days, you need to show up because we're going to need your okay. And that, again, was more transparency to keep them involved. And that was our kind of our red light, green light to know what we can go forward with and where we need to stop. And here's kind of a snapshot of our actual project plan. So this was our actual project manager's kind of thing. And we would use an arrow, like a map in a mall, <laughs> to say, we are here. So this is where we should be. And here's what, we, um, here's what we have left. Or here's maybe some stuff from last week we didn't get done. So again, tr you know, sharing everything. No, nothing's off, off limits, no secrets. Everybody can see everything, and so can the stakeholders if they need to. And so once we got through all that, I was like, great. Now can we get into the nitty gritty? Like, I'm ready to clean this site up, let's do it. And then they said, we said, no, we still got stuff to do. And I said, oh, you're right. Um, so <laughs> I am so impatient. I'm just like, let me do my job. Um, but no, this was the best part of this was to come, and that was really talking to the audience. So understanding who this was for. We kind of already said job seekers, um, employers who want to start apprenticeship programs, great. But you know, we didn't really have a face to those. We didn't have a, a voice to those. So knowing our audience is so important. And I think it gets lost in projects a lot. Um, it gets lost even in big projects, but it definitely gets lost in small projects. And this was an important project for them, and it was an important project to me, because they're really trying to connect with people to resources and opportunities in their community. So I asked them, I said, you know, who's your audience? And we, we kind of had an idea, but who was most likely to need this? Why do they need it? Where do they start their experience from? What questions do they have? Are they getting what they need? And we couldn't answer that because we're not the audience. So we really reached out to folks. And this is what was really great about working with this organization is because they have such a close-knit relationship with businesses in the community, those businesses had apprentices who were like, I'd love to share my experience of what it was like finding this role. And the businesses had feedback about what it was like starting their program. So we got them lined up. We had some really great calls in our queue, but we also had a really phenomenal resource at our fingertips with the user surveys. So the state of Massachusetts has a survey on each page of their website, and it says, did you find what you're looking for today? Now, offering users access to that information is like opening up a survey for feedback in a grumpy break room at an office. Um, you don't know what you're going to get. Um, it's, it's not the box of chocolates that Forrest Gump enjoys. So you might find lots of issues and problems you didn't know you had. You might get some less than savory feedback from the public. Uh, but I recommend it because once you weed through that, you start seeing a lot of patterns. And so we went through all of the apprentice pages they had and started pulling stuff out. 
And we noticed there was a lot of really good stuff in there. Things like, you know, does not give clear direction for the ePlace portal, which is how the apprentice um, sponsorship employers actually access their program information. How do I get a replacement apprenticeship ID card? Uh-oh, there's an audience. Existing apprentices? We hadn't thought about that. I cannot find the forms needed for a person to apply for an apprenticeship. We are, uh, we are sponsors and we have people who want to apply. Okay, existing employers that have programs? Another audience we kind of hadn't really considered. And then even just general questions like, do I need a diploma or GED to get this job? So we were finding all of this stuff was really helpful. Clearly people asking for it because they couldn't find it. And so this is a snippet of some of the stuff we got. Um, you know, what are the benefits? All these really great pieces of information that, oh my gosh, no one had looked at it for a while. And rather than grumble about the complaints, we used it as a tool. It was a wealth of information. And as we started looking at our Google Analytics and tracking the pages, like the top pages, the top pages is where we saw the biggest bounce rates and where we saw most of the questions coming in. So it was really interesting to us to start tracking the patterns of what people were actually looking for and what we thought they needed. And that gave us all a big pause. And so then we took the, so it was great. We had some surveys. These were still strangers to us, but we still got a wealth of information. So we were so grateful for folks that left feedback. But we went back to those businesses and those apprentices and said, hey, you guys want to chat? And we ended up interviewing about 24 people. Once word got out that we were working on this, some other related agencies were like, hey, we refer people to apprenticeships. Can we talk to you about our experience? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> please take a seat. Um, and then the stakeholders as well. So why the stakeholders cared about this. And so it was really crucial to us that we have these conversations. Now, that again, month one was user research and discovery. So there's a lot going on in month one. It was, it was, a, it was a really long month. But we grouped some of our calls together. So some places we had calls with apprentices who were there with their job sponsors and their managers. So we could talk to a couple people at a time and made it a lot easier. So we got on the phone with them and, you know, like a business owner said, it'd be great to have a place that lists unions, labor and non-labor. Well, I wasn't on the site. And over and over, the job seekers said, we just want to see a list of apprenticeships. <laughs> What's funny is they had a list of apprenticeships buried in an Excel link with a click here somewhere on the site. And we really started to find that this was the biggest request of all. And as a journalist, I just love asking questions. So I continued to ask these questions over and over and I really enjoyed hearing them. And they were so honest. And they told us more stuff beyond that. They said, these are the types of questions I have. When I first was looking for an apprenticeship, I wanted to know who was hiring. I wanted to know how I apply. I wanted to know if I should go to college or if this is a better, a better route for me. So again, people asking about the future of apprenticeship. Is this the right choice? Now, you could Google that and probably find you know, Department of Labor articles on, on apprenticeships. But for a Massachusetts resident, maybe there's more. So we started finding opportunities where, again, you know, benefits of apprenticeship, they want to do that promo page. Well, here we go. We're starting to get some kind of some framework for what that page should be. Business owners, too, were really confused about how to create a program. Their current site had some information, but it wasn't very clear and the steps weren't very obvious. Um, and then people who were, had a program wanted to know, how do I start connecting with people who are looking for a job? And that content wasn't available. And then where do I manage my programs and jobs? The portal, where's the portal link? Nobody knew. So we really had to do some work and start prioritizing some things. And in between all of that, we get through all of that process, we really had to step back and do some content strategy 101. And that's the, the, the big deliverables and the big assets and pieces of it that really help you understand what you're working with. So we really said, okay, let's gather our stuff. We talked to a lot of people, we've got our goals, we've got our people, we've got our extended team, the stakeholders are on board, this is great. Um, but we still had stuff we needed to gather. So we really focused on things like the content inventory. Um, the content inventory is um, a list of all the things on your website, all the PDFs, all the images, all the pages. Uh, from that, we did the audit, which is what do you want to keep from your inventory? Then we talked about user research, which we already had started. We had comparative research to do. So, you know, Massachusetts is one of 50 states. Other states have apprenticeship programs. Let's find out how they're doing this. How are they talking about this? 
We didn't call it competitive research either. We called it comparative because we just wanted to say, let's see how we can do this. Let's get some ideas. And then lastly, your hard data, your Google Analytics, your keywords, understanding what you're working with. What are the questions that people have? What kind of things are they putting in the search engine? What kind of things are they searching in the site? But the audit was really important because this team was maybe three or four years into this process or being at this department and they had never done an audit. And so the audit is really the what, what do you have and how is it working? And so we made a couple of columns. And usually with an audit, I send it to a client and I say, here you go, tell me what you want to keep, tell me what you want to get rid of. But in this case, they said, could you help us? And I said, of course. So I provided some notes and questions and considerations for them on one column, and then they came back and answered me on the other. And so it kind of became our little chat space where if we weren't on the, on the call, on you know, the three times a week call that we had, they were working on this and I was working on this, and sometimes at the same time, which is always fun to see happen. But we worked as a team, and sometimes my notes guided their answers, and sometimes their reply guided my recommendation. So it was really a very cohesive process with them that I really enjoyed. But what was interesting is they, we pulled all this together and they said, oh, there's so many pages that shouldn't be live. <laughs> and I said, that happens all the time, this is why we do this. Um, it's kind of like moving houses. When you move a house, you're like, oh, we gotta go through the basement. We're not taking that Christmas tree and those Halloween decorations gotta go and this. You don't wanna take all that stuff to the new house. And so this is a necessary process in any redesign, but I really encourage you to just tidy up every six months or so. It keeps it a little bit easier to do. And the rot content method was huge for them. <laughs> Once they went through it and said, I have three pages saying the same thing. And I'm like, combine them, get it down to one. Oh, wow, there's something published that really should have been unpublished two years ago. Get it out of there now, take it out. <laughs> and even trivial content. Trivial content happens when you know a stakeholder knocks on your door and says, there needs to be a page for this. And you're like, no, there doesn't. And then you're like, fine. Um, that content exists and always hides in the darkest corners. So anyway, that was really their method, was going through and saying, what is really important here for us and for our audience? So the raw content method, maybe, maybe my favorite thing about auditing content. Comparative research, we looked at, I don't know, maybe, maybe 10 other states to see how they talk about apprenticeships. Some were doing it better than them, some were doing it not as well. But we found, like, you know, the state of Minnesota was doing the videos they wanted to do. They talked to marketing, uh, the mass marketing team said, we'll do some videos of apprenticeship programs. Great, what should they look like? Freeze, I don't know. Um, Minnesota had some really good ones where they interviewed apprentices and talked about their journey and their process, and they talked to businesses about the benefits of apprenticeship programs. And so they said, well, that'll be kind of our template for when we do our own. Um, we found out how other states were talking and organizing their content and how they were building step pages to help people walk through the process. And anyway, their eyes twinkled and just said, I want that. I want that too. Just like when we watch home shows and we want, I want those countertops. Um, they wanted all of those things too. So we really focused on that. And so we weren't the ones responsible for making the videos, but we kind of set that to the side and said, hey, video team, we found some stuff that we really like. So again, we were helping each other. We were helping teams that weren't even involved on this project. We were helping them do their work. And of course, remember us, are the folks that we spoke to. Now, user personas are kind of uh, a hit and miss topic. Um, I'm myself, as a content strategist, I'm kind of neutral on them, but my clients at DAS really wanted them on paper because as they continued to have these conversations and go back to that core strategy statement in the future, they wanted to, people to be aware that there are real people on the other side of the screen that need this stuff. And so we built some user personas um, and focused on some of the things we'd heard in the interviews and the different things that we know they needed. It was really, really important to us to keep that going. And then we took that and we made it into a journey map too. And the journey map was really focused on what's their current experience and what's, gonna, what's it gonna be in the future? Where are they feeling frustrated? And over and over again, our users who told us, I just wanna see a list of apprenticeships. So it was really great for us to get this on paper. And some of it, again, was for the stakeholders so they could feel like they understood where things were going. Some of it was for our team, but it kept everyone informed. And having it documented was really helpful. So I'm gonna, again, another pause. You know, that's a lot of stuff, Aaron. You're talking a lot, like a lot. Um, so now what happens? Well, that's what they asked me. And I was like, yeah, I hear you. Um, we had to sort out our priorities. Um, so Ronald Weasley says it best. She's gotta get out and sort out her priorities. 
So we really had to prioritize. We heard a lot of stuff. We, oh, we wanted to burn that house down. We wanted to start over from scratch, but we knew we did not have that kind of time to work with. So we made a list, right? You make a list. You make a list when you clean your house. You make a list when you're packing for a trip. We made a list. And that list became our, again, another document that kept us and our stakeholders aligned with where we were going and what we were doing. So we took all the stuff we heard, all the surveys, all the interviews, all the research, what we heard, and we counted them, and we highlighted them. And so we heard a lot of people say things a lot, over and over. We looked at everything. The biggest one, again, was, I just want to know what the apprenticeships are. Fair. That's a really good one. So the more we heard that comment, the more we read that comment, the higher it got on the list. Because we really wanted this to affect real people. It didn't matter what the stakeholders wanted. I mean, it does, but it doesn't. We want to affect the people that are actually needing this content. So we counted how often it came up and how valuable it was or wasn't. And so we really looked at the priority and the value, the effort, and the impact. Now, your value and impact might be aligned, but your effort might not be. So something that's really high value might end up being lower effort than you thought, and vice versa. So know that going into a priority list that you might have some tough decisions to make even once you have the list um, in order. But that was really important to us. Unclear how to apply for apprenticeship programs and the steps involved. Seven call-outs from job seekers. We had a how-to page, but it was for the trades only. That's another thing. Massachusetts was expanding their apprenticeship programs into finance and education and culinary. It wasn't just about trade jobs anymore. So their website wasn't even capturing all of these great opportunities that people were looking for. We identified the priority, the value, and the effort. And then again, to required for each item, tried to understand it a little bit more. And we couldn't do all the things. You know, there were a few one-off comments and questions that people had that we thought, that's really great, but it's gonna have to go lower. So anything we couldn't do, we put on a list to say, hey, post-launch, we've got more to do. I always tell my clients on every project, your website's never done. They've grown always because that's a horrible thing to hear when you've worked so hard. But you really need to understand that you can still make improvements after day of launch. And so we made a list of those things. And again, just like our content audit, we used it as a place to chatter with each other. So we talked to each other, we referred to the list often, we'd write down our notes, we'd ask each other questions, and we'd come back to it at a meeting or we'd come back to it in the document. So any kind of shareable document where you can do that with others, I think is really useful. And it's just more transparent. We can't be on the phone 24 hours a day with each other, probably for the best, but using documents like this can be really good. And then when we had those demos, remember when we had the demos with the different stakeholders, we would bring in a list of, hey, it's October, here's what we're doing. Here's what's runners up for November, if we can't get to it this month, and here's what's out of scope right now. And that became our other list of, hey, here's how things are working out. We want you to know we're committed to these things. This is confetti, and this is not happening. <laughs> so again, that became really important to us to be transparent. We wanted them to understand where that grant money was going and how we were, how we were working to make this possible. Now, I mentioned the content matrix several slides ago. And I don't know how many people have ever used a content matrix. It's a spreadsheet. I love spreadsheets. I know it's not everybody's thing. But the content matrix is a spreadsheet of the entire sitemap. It's what goes where, what lives with what, what kind of improvements can we make, what the source URL for some of this content is. And I kind of call it the Stefan of documents because it literally has everything. Um, it is a site blueprint. It is a structure. It has the URL structures. It has recommendations. It has a tracking document. We used it as a governance tool to kind of assign ourselves different pages of content that we were tackling at a time. So the content matrix became our map and our uh, really firm kind of guidebook for how we were gonna do this project and knock it out. So here's kind of a breakdown of it. The matrix visualizes the parent-child relationship of pages and site structures. So you can see in the green column is a parent page and then in the pink column, or the yellow column is a child page and then the, in the orange column are more child pages. So you can kind of see that waterfall of what lives where. And that was important for structure. We wanted to know what pages were going to live with what pages. We wanted to make sense of the website and have a navigation that worked. Um, we also had notes and recommendations. So as we started writing it, or as we were moving content, making notes about what we could improve along the way. So kind of stepping into the content design world a little bit, kind of in copywriting, but just more, again, how can we improve this as we're going along? Not every page needed to be rewritten either. Some of it just could have been edited and this document tracked what that was. 
We also identified templates. They had a host of content templates and content types in Drupal. Um, so we knew which kind of content type to use when we got to that page. We also kept track of the source URLs because as we mentioned, there was places where they had three or four of the same pages. Let's knock those out and put them on one. Um, and that way we knew what pages we could also redirect. So if we were taking three pages and combining to one in the new world, what three pages need to be redirected in the, in the new world post launch? So that was a really good tool for us as well. And then once we started actually writing the content, we divided the work as we went along. So I would pick up pages and someone else would pick up pages. And once we published those changes, we would post the publish date. And so this was really our tool to stay informed and use as a project plan. And we could kind of work backwards and say, hey, we've got this many pages we need to write or this many to edit. Averaging X amount of hours per page, we have this much time to get this done. And that helped us set up our schedule for the following months. So we got all that stuff done. We were super stoked. We hit publish when we could, and we went ahead and said, let's implement this stuff and let's measure it. And so we worked hard. That last month and a half or so, we really were cranking out work, reviewing it together, reviewing it with stakeholders, moving along, hitting publish. And we were so proud of how much we got done. Um, and again, because we started at the beginning, because we brought those people in early, they knew they needed to be involved in the approval so that these pages could be published by the date that we had set. So again, having that stuff written down, having your core strategy statement, having those kickoff meetings and documentations of who owns what really made sure that those stakeholders were on our side when we needed them. So yeah, how did that all work out for us? Uh, real great, honestly. Um, he probably said that snarky, but I'm gonna pretend like he's being nice. Um, he, <laughs> how did this work out for us? It worked out great. We ended up with a new homepage, reorganized with plain language. Simplified buttons for access to employer, employer portals and searchable apprenticeship listing. Yeah, that was a big one. We'll show that in a minute. Focused navigation for audiences for job seekers, employers, and veterans, which was a job, which is one of the agencies that came to us when this project started and said, hey, in the VA, we refer people to apprenticeships when they come home. Can we get some feedback? Can we provide some feedback on how your site could help us? Oh, please. Uh, and we ended up creating an entire new veteran page that was plain language to help veterans get access to what they needed. New promo page. Uh, again, they want to do this promo page. We're like, mm, this might be confetti. Let's see if we can do it. We did it. Uh, benefit and education focused promotional page led with simple how-to pages and instructions for employers and apprentices and marketing team created videos to promote apprenticeships in the state. So this was huge for them and they gave it a kind of a vanity URL and they put it on their brochures and they used it at job fairs. So huge success for them to get that out the door. Before the rewrites, they had one page for apprenticeships called Apprenticeships for the Trades. As we know, those trades are one of many different apprenticeships you can have. It lacked specific instructions and next steps and provided no information about benefits. And in the new world, we did it entirely differently. And after the rewrites, we focused on the broader page for all apprenticeships. We used plain language and provided step-by-step -step instructions and added a searchable table of open apprenticeships. <gasps> the thing everyone wanted. So, okay, this is what's great about bringing someone in who knows the system better than you. Uh, the person we brought in for marketing who knows Drupal said, did you know that you could just like put a CSV in Drupal and it'll turn it into a table? And I said, no. So we took that CSV and oh my gosh, it turned it into a filterable, sortable table. <sighs> the relief we felt with that was wonderful. Um, so we got this up. People were so excited about it. It was finally visible. It wasn't hidden in a, in a link. We were so happy. Um, it was no longer buried and people were stoked about it. I've got more to say about that in a minute, but that was the biggest win right there. So how did all this turn out? We did all this stuff. We did all the things. We had some things we didn't get accomplished, but we got most of it done. So drum roll, please. Um, you don't have to. Um, <laughs> um, what did we track? We revisited our Google Analytics and page user feedback and heard directly from sponsors and job seekers and our customer service frontline folks who, again, give them a hug. Um, they do wonderful work. And what we found with those three to six months of tracking was an average 85% increase in page views. So that was huge for them. They were happy about that. The promo page brought in a ton of traffic from their different job fairs that they promoted it to. They had a 50% decrease in bounce rate back when bounce rates were a thing. That was huge. We were seeing such high bounce rates from people who couldn't find answers and we saw that go down by half. That was wonderful. We saw a 31% increase of new users to find an apprenticeship page. 
So that page that was just for the trades that we made broader and more plain language, we saw a huge increase in that. That was wonderful. And the frontline staff said, oh, finally people are finding what they need on the website. They're not calling us. Our emails aren't being stacked up. We can actually focus on other things we need to do for this department. And we were so relieved about that. And remember that 40% we wanted to see at the beginning? We had a 42% increase in positive feedback from users. In six months after launch, we saw most comments ending with the words thank you. And that was not something we planned for, and that was the metric we liked the most. We'd never seen anyone say thank you before in those comments. And so we knew there were people out there job searching who had come back after the redesign and seen the changes, and they were so happy with it. And that made us happier than anything else. So that's great, but we said there were some opportunities left on the table. Job seekers said they would like to see more information and contact information, especially for businesses in the table of apprenticeship openings. Fair. Business owners wanted more self-help documentation for using the portal where they manage their apprenticeship listings. Also fair. So even though my contract was with them and my work with this team was over, we left them a playbook of what they can continue to work toward in the future and to keep building and keep doing and keep improving. And since this project, more Massachusetts agencies are taking this approach to improve their own content. I think we had two or three agencies that came to us afterward and said, we really want to do what Apprenticeship did. Um, we want to make our content better. And that, that made us really happy because that's really what it was about. And yes, Apprenticeship standards could have been its own website and that's a huge thing on its own, but because it was just a small slice of this very large government body, it was really fun to take this opportunity to put a process in place and document it and say, we can do this again. We could take this and roll with it with other agencies too. So just remember, if you're facing that, if you're out there, you have clients out there, you don't have to burn it all down. You don't have to do a complete redesign. You can start one room at a time. Thank you so much for listening. Feel free to reach out to me if you have questions. I'll take questions now, too. Um, you can find me on Medium, where I muse about this stuff all day, uh, or on LinkedIn, where I do the same. Uh, so thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, thank you. So I'll take... What time is it? I'll take a few questions. We've got a few minutes left. Ooh, really, truly, like three minutes. Any questions out there? Yes? Uh, can you list, uh, list some of the tools that you use specifically for the inventory and the audit? Yes. Uh, so tools I use for the inventory and audit. So we use a tool at Lullabot called Screaming Frog, and that's probably the most common one. Um, I know there's a lot of different tools out there that do inventories, but that one's the most complete, and you can really customize it. Um, in terms of the audit, we would just export it to a spreadsheet in Google Sheets or Excel and add some headings. And even now, we've started adding columns in our audits for clients that are things like, you know, who's this for? When was the last time it was updated? Like, things to make them think. So when they actually get to that page and they're don't know, that's a pretty good indicator that they need to <laughs> do their homework. Um, so typically Excel or Sheets for the audit and the inventory we use um, Screaming Frog. Yes? How soon after you the project, did you revisit the surveys? Um, the last part, I'm sorry? How soon after you finished, did you revisit the surveys? Oh, um, it, it, between three and six months. Yeah, yeah, we were, most of those were six months after because we wanted to keep it up for a while. Yes? Ah, how did we, yes, so the question was how did we deal with stakeholders who didn't meet their deadlines? Um, we kind of said, went into it with them on that first kickoff to say if you aren't available, well one thing we say at any kickoff is hey, are there any big vacations coming up? Like if somebody's going to Tahiti for a month, like we're going to keep moving without you. Um, but we also made that clear too, like if you're going to miss this, either designate someone as a proxy to make this decision for you or tell us it's okay to keep moving because we really can't hold this up. And because it was grant-based, I think that's why they were pretty um, flexible with us and, and helpful. But we did make that very clear. Like, we have several stakeholders, and I, we don't want to wait for just one of you that's behind. So you have to be a little more assertive than I'm, than I'm even comfortable with, but I'm glad we were. Anything else? All right, I'm going to cut you loose. Lunches are probably still available if you're hungry. <laughs> Thank you.